Okay, now let's look visually, and this is where the real, the physical understanding is. Let's look at the effect on the array size by adding elements. Okay, so the we've got a linear broadside array. These red dots are the is the array. They're isotropic elements. The spacing is lambda over two apart. There's no phase shifting, so we're just going to have a broadside beam perpendicular to the array. Here we see it's the angle off broadside is zero. And with 10 elements, we get this gain with this many side lobe, with this many nulls and side lobes. And with double the number of elements, you see we get about double the number of side lobes, and you can see it gets thinner, and we go to 40, and it gets even thinner. And in general, for long broadside arrays, the gain is approximately twice the number of elements times lambda, excuse me, times d divided by lambda. Now let's see what happens when we increase the broadside array size by separating the elements. That is to say we start off with uh, D at, at a quarter wavelength space separation. We get a gain of 70 D. When we go to a D of uh, lambda over 2 separation, that we get more gain, but when we go to separation of lambda and where uh, the we're right on broadside, there is the beam, we get grading lobes out here. So we've got a real problem to deal with a lot of the energy is going out into the grading lobes. And one of the things you'll see since planar arrays aren't used at all to scan out 70, 80 degrees, um, you can eliminate completely the separation if we limit the element separation to usually it's lambda over 2. We prevent grading lobes for broadside arrays in any of the practical space that we would consider. So if we wanted to uh, operate an array uh, to, to scan plus or minus 45 degrees and have four of them, four arrays to cover 360 degrees, we'd only, you know, we don't, we, lambda over two would be just fine for us. But this is looking at the angle off broadside just if we keep the the required phase at beta equals zero and we're dealing with this kind of a an array. Now when we go to the term n fire, which means we shift the phase uh, and the separation so that all of the so that we're looking down uh, the completely down the, the end of the array and point the antenna in that direction with lambda over 4 separation we're just fine and with, with uh, lambda over 2 we have we're okay but we have a grading lobe over here at 90 degrees and then we have at lambda at separation d over lambda we have two grading lobes so no grading lobes for elements separation less than lambda over two and again there's a without your like the gain is approximately 4l over, divided by lambda for long and fired arrays without grading lobes now another thing that happens uh, is when we scan an array, this shows you what happens. When we take an array, 
which in this case is 20 elements spaced lambda over 4. And we're at broadside. We have a 10 dB over isotropic gain. And we scan th to 30 degrees. We get uh, a beam broadening from 10 degree beam to a 12 degree beam. And then 22 degrees scanning. Uh, to, excuse me, the beam width is 22 degrees at 60 degree scan angle. And we're at end fire when we're 90 degrees off. And the beam width is 49 degrees. So this gives you the equations showing what the required phases are to scan over all space without grading lobes. What we want to do is to keep the element separation D less than lambda over 2. Now this is well. Now we're generalizing in the next next section to two-dimensional arrays, and the problem is completely separable. We have an, instead of a psi, we have psi x and y, and the angles beta. We have uh, beta x and y, and the progressive phase to scan to theta 0 and phi 0 is beta x and y equal to these values. And to scan over all space without grading lobes, uh, the spacing in the x direction has to be less than lambda over 2, and in the y direction, lambda over 2. You can see they're laid out in a rectangular pattern. It could be square. And you notice we're, we're looking. And in, in, if, the, if in the, y, the array is located in the xy plane, and we're looking at the spherical angle and spherical coordinates theta and phi above the xy plane, where the beam is out in the z out from the z-axis in the far field in that direction, and you can see it's just the product of the array factors in each dimension. And here's what this looks like when uh, you, you build a pretty graph of it. It's a 25 element square away, and the beam is pointing at broadside with lambda over 2 spacing. And uh, there's no uh, phase shifting from element to element. And the number of elements uh, is 5 in the end each of the two Cartesian directions in the x and y plane. And this is the z direction. And it's the relative magnitude, this is 1. Okay. So let's go over again a little bit uh, more about the change in beam width with scan angle that you noticed. There is a functional relationship, and we'll get to it in a minute. The array beam width in the, in the plane of the scan increases as the beam is scanned off broadside. That was perfectly obvious to a few graphs ago. But with uniform illumination, there's a formula that you can use. The half power beam width is given by 0.886 lambda over d n cosine theta 0. And with a cosine on a pedestal illumination, it has a little slightly different form. And the corresponding beam width of these quantities, where A0 and A1 are functions of the relative the cosine and on a pedestal illumination. In addition to changes in the main beam, the side lobes also change in appearance and position. And that was obvious when I showed you before. And I'm going to go back for a minute. You can see that the shape of the beam changed and the width of the beam changed. 10, 12, 22, 49, and there. That's what that's all. That tells you in a picture what I just showed you. And this tells you in words and formulas. Now there are two ways uh, to to do shifting of the beam. What we really want to do 
is to move the phase of the phase front d sine theta zero to scan the beam and amount theta. And we can do that two ways. We've talked about phase shifting by putting a phase shifter in of 2 pi d over lambda times the th sine of theta zero. But we can also shift, put a time shift in between the two where this little squiggle represents a time delay equal to d over c times sine theta zero. The time delay steering requires switched lines. It's relatively a lossy method. It's relatively high cost. And phase shifting is mainly used in phased array radars. But I wanted to point out to you that there's two ways to get those phase fronts all lined up, time delay steering or phase shifting steering. In the early days before phase shifter technology really came into its own, radars were built with time delay steering. Also, and also the most prevalent cause of bandwidth limitation in phase array radars is the use of phase shifters, spelling error, rather than time delay devices to steer the beam. Time shifting is not frequency dependent, but phase shifting is. Lecture. Okay, now what are, the phase, what are the bandwidth limitations on phase arrays? With, with, with phase shifts, the, and the peak is scanned to a desired angle only at the center frequency. And since the radar signal has a finite bandwidth, the antenna beam width broadens as the beam is scanned off broadside. And so the beam is going to shift See, notice that the phase shift depends on lambda. Lambda depends on the frequency. So you're going to have a shifting. You're going to have a squinted beam pattern when you change frequencies over the center frequency that you operate at. And for wide scan angles of approximately 60 degrees, the bandwidth percentage is about twice the 3 dB beam width. Another thing you can do to deal with uh, side lobes is to thin arrays. Now this, is, this, this turns out to be pretty nice for a couple of reasons. One is every uh, element uh, costs money. And if you thin out the elements, you keep the same uh, power and aperture, you, you can, it, it can be a helpful cost issue. And this is a, an example uh, taken from uh, uh, Joe Frank in, in, in Merrill Skolnick's handbook of a randomly thinned array of 4,000 element, uh, 4, element grid with 900 elements, which I've re-rendered. And you can see that you get 31 0.5 dB average side lobe level. The gain is calculated using the actual number of elements. It's G equals N pi. Excuse me. G equals pi N. The beam is equivalent to the filled array. And the side lobe level is raised in proportion to the number of elements deleted. The element pattern is the same as that of a filled array if missing elements are replaced with matched loads. I might add that there are other ways of dealing with uh, thinned arrays, but I'm not going to get into that in this lecture. And you can look those up in the books. So again, just like we went through amplitude weighting for array elements, we can do the same thing with phased arrays. So if we have a 16 element array with two different illumination weights, in one case uniform illumination, you know, you're down 13 dB, and with a 40 dB Taylor pattern, and the Taylor patterns are used in phased array antennas a lot of the time, and they give you uniform side lobes. Uh, you can get 40 dB side lobes with Taylor weights. 
uh, illumination functions. And uh, in part one, I discussed illumination uh, functions in general a lot. The low side lobe windows are often used to suppress grating lobes. And amplitude and phase errors will ultimately uh, limit the attainable level of side lobe suppression. And phase array monopulse techniques uh, we'll discuss in the parameter estimation lecture, I want to note. And here's the effect of random errors in arrays, another example of a 40 dB Chebyshev pattern on a 100 element array with no errors in the phase shifts. But if we have random errors in amplitude and phase in the element current, that can be due to broken or missing elements too, phase shift to quantization errors, multiple couple, mutual coupling effects, which we'll get to later. Uh, if you add all that together, you can see that, as I, I call it, this is life, and this is the antenna theorists would say your array side lobes would be. And when you make it, you this is what you measure, because all there are phase errors when you build things, amplitude errors when you build things, etc. Now let's go on to grading lobes.